like to welcome you to the meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Buena Vista. Uh, it's June 13th, 2023. Time is 7.05 p.m. Um, please silence your cell phones. And uh, Paula, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Fay. Here. Trustee Cobb. Here. Trustee Hilton Hinga. Here. Trustee Lucrezzi. Trustee Rowe. Here. And Trustee Swisher. Here. Great. And uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, we have an agenda for the evening, and uh, I'd like to know if anyone has any um, changes to the agenda. Um, and if not, I would accept a motion to pass the agenda as written. I'll make that motion. Second. So Roe and Cobb, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? And then we have the consent agenda which has a variety of things in it. Um, one of them is um, people who are uh, on the airport board, the airport advisory board. Um, the, uh, there's an appointment of William DeLay as a regular voting member with a term ending December, 2025. And appointment of Ted Osowski as an alternate member with a term ending December 2025. Thank you all for your service on the airport board. And Sue Cobb is our liaison there. And they say she's learned a lot. <laughs> she says that too. <laughs> I see. Um, so um, are there any changes or anything that a trustee would like to have pulled out of the consent agenda and discussed separately? Um, I would like to add, ask, and I'm trying to get down to the minutes of the tree advisory board, um, the, uh, the item about the uh, Sago de Cristo, um, the, the trees, the, uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find it, but what, where things stand, what the next steps are with that, whether there will be a public hearing on just the clearing of trees for the, the hires, does, does anybody know? Yeah. Um, would you like to speak to that, Philip? I will. Um, yeah, thank you, Trustee Cobb, for bringing that up. So what I would anticipate is that Public Works Director Sean Williams will probably provide an update in his staff report next meeting. Um, he's He would be the staff point person on the topic. Um, Public Works staff and the advisory board, as you, as you noticed, um, have have been in discussions with, with Sangre de Cristo about their plans. Um, they've actually put out a couple of press releases on the matter, knowing that um, it's gonna get community attention about impacts to trees and the right of way. Um, it is a very serious situation that they're looking at. We've seen wildfires across the country started because of power lines, um, things like that. So. It's, um, it's something that they have recognized as needing more, I guess, community awareness about what they're doing, why and when. So I, I think Sean's gonna provide an update to you all next meeting. And then he's also inviting um, representatives from Sangre de Cristo to come share that with the board directly since it's their uh, projects and things like that. So yeah, so I'd say stay tuned. Um, I don't anticipate necessarily a public hearing or anything like that, but certainly the board could request further updates from them when they come and present. We'll see what they say at that point. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other items on the consent agenda that um, anyone would like to talk about? Um, in that case, I'd take a... Um, a motion to pass the consent agenda as written. I so move. Second. So we have Cobb and Swisher. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? The motion passes. Now we go to the section of our meeting um, where people can make um, public comments. Um, you are limited to uh, three minutes and uh, I'd like for you to start with your name and address and then the three minutes will start. And um, I only have two people who are signed up for public comment. And uh, the first of those is Tom Rawlings. Hi, my name is Tom Rawlings. I live at 26490 Range Drive in the Green Vista. Um, and then really real quickly, I just wanted to say thank you to Trustee Swisher, Trustee Cobb, Mayor, and all the towns, uh, towns representatives that stopped out to help us dedicate the LAC stage. It was a wonderful day, and uh, I know that all kinds of people really appreciate it being there, so, so thank you. Wow. But I just wanted to say also that, you know, in our town, we have uh, some wonderful performance art venues. We've got South Main that has their niche, and, and Larry does a wonderful job with, uh, you know, the, the bands that they bring in from across the country. But uh, the Legacy stage has kind of a niche too. It, it's, it kind of lends itself to community events. And uh, whether it's an orchestra, or a jazz band, or army band, or a play, whatever, um, it's, it's got that kind of feel to it. And, and I'd just like to encourage the trustees in the town to remember that and, you know, get with, our, get with Leslie and maybe talk about how we can encourage that and, and save that. One of the, the really cool things that, that I found out, I, I kind of knew, but one of, one of the, the really cool things is that kids get to use that stage. And, and uh, it's a special place for children as well. Right across the street from the library, uh, kids can go right over there and, and do what they did on that day. It was, it was really wonderful. And uh, I, I just wanted to speak in support of those kinds of programs, the library, the wonderful things they're doing and speak in support of the library expansion. Everybody knows we're growing. And I know from my relatives and friends and everything, they really appreciate the library, the families that kids do. And so anything that we can do to support the library, I think <coughs> we should do. So thank you and have a good meeting. Thank you, Tom. And thanks for all your work on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, and the other person for public comment is Norma Cady. Please go to the podium and then uh, give us your name and address. Hi, I'm Norma Cady, and I keep moving to the rental situation. So I live at 9985 County Road. I'm not County Road, Highway 28524 towards Truck Creek. Anyway. Um, once again, I'm here to talk about Ukraine and the bench project, which has been delayed. And I just wanted to, this is National Geographic's map. It's fabulous. If anybody gets it, there wasn't any article about it. It was just this map. And the town I lived in, this is Eastern Ukraine. Kremina is right here. It's in Russian territory now that they've, taken over. It's just um, 20 or 30 miles north of Bakhmut, which we've all heard about, and Zaporizhia and all these other places where the most of the stuff is happening right now, except for Kiev and a couple places. So anyway, and I want to just say that the man that I worked with there was my cohort there is doing this incredible project of community <clears throat> development throughout Ukraine in spite of the Russians. And I don't know where he is at any one moment because he's everywhere. 
and he and this group of people are doing community development thing. And it's a lot of it has to do with sister cities kinds of ideas. It's not necessarily sister cities, but it's the same concept. And so the bench has not been forgotten. The problem has been two old. One is that we haven't raised enough money to, to guarantee that the person that people that build it are gonna get paid. And the other thing is that their design is sort of waiting. It's Arc Valley Welding now, who's done a lot of stuff here in town. So they're ready to go in October. They have so many other projects. It's like, keeps getting put off and put off. But I want to just say that it's still a big plan to do this bench and um, a place to sit and reflect and think about our community. That's sort of what I'm looking at it as. And so we're still there. Um, they've agreed to do it, but they it's like a conflict of, they need money and we need a guarantee and the design and the place. Um, right now we have about only about $700 in the bank, which is what we got last year. And I don't know how much they're gonna charge. That's the problem. Um, and so we're just gonna try to get the design done and then present it to you guys for this bench. It's gonna be one of those artistic ones um, rather than just um, straight uh, metal, um, whatever. It's gonna be one of the ones with design and it's, I'm really excited about it. And so that's all. I just want to get you to know that we're still interested in it. We want it big time. It's a little tardy, but the stuff is still happening in Ukraine. They're doing well, but thank you. Yeah. Thank you for keeping our attention on it. And okay. Yeah, great. Thanks, Thanks, Norma. Yeah. That's the uh, public comment. And we will go to staff reports. First of them is uh, Chief Morgan. Are you with us? Yeah, I see your cars there. <laughs> yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, good evening, Mayor, trustees. Thank you. Uh, pretty short report. I'll go through it real quickly and then uh, take any questions if there's any. Um, Sorry, I can't seem to get my video to work. So as long as you can hear me, I guess we're good. Um, so yeah, the report's short. We've been really busy. Um, we implemented um, Tyler Technologies. That was approved in uh, this year's budget. Um, and that's an updated record management system for us. Uh, one of the gentlemen from Tyler was out here training with us on that last week uh, from Georgia. Uh, really great training. And me and the officers were really excited about a lot of the features this has that really updates our technology. Paddle Fest went really well. The uh, concert down there, um, no issues. Uh, we had about three DUIs over the weekend, which is kind of high considering we only have you know a couple officers out at a time. Um, so drinking and driving is a concern, and I think we usually see an increase in that over the summer. Um, I did get word today from CDOT that we were awarded the. Uh, um, 2024 High Visibility Enforcement Grant, and that gives us about $6,500 to use for a DUI overtime shifts, so we can still be proactive and and um, trying to curb that type of behavior. Um, the new PD, um, we've done a couple walkthroughs and tours. It's looking really good. It's mostly finished, just doing some touch-up things, and we're still waiting on the HVAC. Um, hopefully we can give the trustees uh, another tour um, once we're moved in and it's a working PD. Uh, so we're getting there. Just have to be patient. Um, there's a couple photos there from the Billy Cordova 5K run. A big shout out to One Love Endurance who organized it. It was very professional. Um, I think Shane might speak to what was raised, but it was really neat to participate. Uh, there was a lot of police and a lot of fire and first responder personnel to support the Cordovas. Um, Billy was our friend to all of us and it was a really cool event and we were proud to be a part of that. Uh, the rodeo, 
last weekend. I uh, did not see anything um, dramatic as far as reports. So I think um, that went really well. I talked to my officers and it sounds like it went really well. Um, I heard it was pretty crowded. So that's good to get a lot of uh, attention on that. Uh, like I said, officers have been really busy. Um, we have had some break-ins over in the area of North Gunnison, um, Pleasant, Waters, um, Brookdale. Um, so we really want to encourage citizens to make sure you're locking your vehicles, your doors, and um, sheds. Uh, some of the sheds and yards were hit too. So if you have a shed, um, try to find a way to lock it up. Um, those become a target of opportunity after hours. Uh, we do have some leads on that that we're working on. That's all I've got. Thank you. Anybody have questions for the chief? Yeah, well, thanks for working those break-ins. That's right next to my house. Yeah, you bet. We're trying to put technology to use. Uh, some of the people, we did some canvases and found some ring doorbell footage and things like that. So there's uh, there's some things we'll be following up on. Thank you for keeping us safe. Well, that's good. Thanks, thanks for your report. Um, now we have the fire chief report. Bertram, are you with us? I am. Um, it tells me the host won't let me use my video, so I guess I'll have to do the same as Chief Morgan. We can hear you. Okay. Um, so a few different things with us. Um, our training captain, Brian Welch, left us uh, last month uh, for a new position for life changes. And so we're excited to bring in a new training captain. His name is Ben Brack. He comes to us from... Um, mixture of stuff, a lot of wildland experience, um, spent time with Gunnison Fire and also in the San Luis Valley. So he's his first day was today. So we're excited to have him on board. Um, many years in the, the fire service. So that's a great addition to us. Still looking for administrative assistant. So anybody knows anybody that wants to be an administrative assistant for us, we'd love to have them uh, apply. Um, moving on fire marshal side of things, we are um, still working with the county um, on uh, review of the 2021 fire code. We did meet with Slide of Fire and came up with our recommendations for adoption with that. Uh, next steps, we go to the county, the county would adopt that, and then we'd be coming to you all uh, to review what the 2021 code would mean um, if it was adopted in the town of Buena Vista. Uh, some of the key things on it, there's a lot of items from the current code, which is seven years old, um, some things that apply to it, food trucks, among other items. Um, so, uh, like I said, we would present it to you guys to let you know what the changes would be moving to the new code. Um, and so that's something to look for in the future. Um, as far as inspections, they've been busy with commercial inspections, short-term rental inspections, uh, plan reviews, all of those type of things. Plan review, commercial plan reviews do take a significant amount of time to do. Um, so the seven we did last month, six of them were in the town. Um, a big thing we've been working on is when we go out, our inspectors go out and do inspections on commercial occupancies. You know, we're, we're looking for voluntary compliance, be able to work with them. Uh, some of the ones that uh, may have been behind inspections, falling off previous inspection schedules, uh, have a lot of extension cords, those type of things. Uh, we were happy with one of, one of the occupancies we did buy some. Um, UL listed power strips, which are allowed, and our inspector spent several hours with one of the local businesses and removed 11 extension cords from the business, ultimately making it safer for the community. So that was may seem insignificant for some, but it was a pretty big win for, for us being able to do that. Um, moving on training side of things, um, with Captain Welch's um, leaving us, we did complete the Firefighter One Academy. We have five interior qualified firefighters. Uh, to be in interior qualified, you have to have your Firefighter 1 certification, your Hazmat Operations certification, which is about a five-month process. Uh, if you were to go to a community college, it's um, about 15 credit hours of classes that they've got to do. Um, so they've completed that as well as they have to do a nine-minute physical agility test. Our physical agility test, everybody has to do in 15 minutes. They have to do it faster in nine minutes. Um, so it's great to have five more interior qualified. Um, 
still working our strategic goals, our ISO assessment. We're still waiting results on that. ISO is what some of the insurance companies use. It's basically a rating of the fire department. Um, so we're hoping to be able to improve the current ISO. So we're kind of waiting on those results. Um, outside of that, construction on station four. Um, yeah, we, we're we working on some items there. I'm not sure when we're gonna be able to move in. I am pretty jealous of uh, Keith Morgan, who will definitely be in the building long before us. Um, we're about a year and a half um, over schedule. Uh, we were supposed to have moved in in January of 2022. Um, so we're hoping someday we'll be able to do that. Um, we did have, uh, you know, Chief Morgan brought up the Cordova 5K. Uh, we we have three of our firefighters actually ran the 5K in full bunker gear with an air pack on. Uh, they're a little sore afterwards, but they they did that. We had our flag out there. It was great to see all the people that came out for that. Um, and then incidents here to date, um, which is probably a good thing. We are slightly down this year. Um, so about it. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I have a question on the ISO assessment. Um, yes. Does that affect people's insurance rates? And does the fire department have a long-term plan for um, continually improving its ISO rating? Yes. So ISO is a scale of one to 10, one being the best, 10 being the worst. Um, in general, anything outside of miles from a fire station period is an ISO 10, the worst you can have. That's just how they look at it. Um, and then they look at it uh, from there, anything you know, within a thousand feet of a fire hydrant, five miles of a station has a different rating. Currently it's at a five. So five is mid range. So we're looking to improve that with our training center, with our additional staffing, the resident program, all of that. So we're hoping to do that. Now the entire ISO system, um, for the rating, it's actually 40% uh, of it is the water system. 10% um, of it is our dispatch center and 50% is the fire department. So out of the 100% thing, the fire department's actually only 50% of it. So water supply is a huge thing. Uh, fortunately, we do have a good water system in BV. Um, so we'll have a, a split assessment, but a lot of, a lot of the, you know, especially in town, the insurance companies go use the ISO as a reference. When we get outside of town, there's various different means that they have because they, they really don't want to insure anybody that's in the mountains, have trees around them. Thank you. Yep. Any other fire department questions? Steve? Thank you. So uh, do we have Jack Wiles with us, the airport manager? Jack is on. I know he's traveling this evening, but looked like he was on. Coming in from elsewhere. Jack, can you hear us? Is he muted? Yeah, he's he's muted on his side. I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, you're on mute, but I can't unmute. Okay. okay. He's on now. Okay. All right. Well, we can proceed if he jumps in. He you can, but okay. his report is in the packet. Um, if there's any questions, we can capture that. I would say that um, airport is staffed up and ready for summer operations. Um, so that's good. Uh, they are looking to start the apron rehab at Prince location, major construction project this year. And that's one of the things uh, that was in the consent agenda was the FAA portion of that large capital project. So now that that's approved, we can get things signed and, and they can continue to move ahead with that. Um, 
if that's about Good. it. That thanks, thanks for filling yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> now you have three hats. Yeah, there you go. Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, the next item is a public hearing with regard to the crossings. And I would like to open the public hearing. Um, and then I would like to turn it over to staff um, to let us know what's happening with that. That's great. Um, so yeah, another hat. Um, <laughs> so we, we had to keep this on the agenda tonight as a public hearing because it was published, publicly noticed. Um, and you'll see on the agenda that, um, you know, staff would make a recommendation for the board to take some form of action, whether that's a continuation or to cancel the public hearing. Uh, I do want to point out that this is not um, this is not the doing of Paul Andrews and the crossings development um, with the um, loss of our planning staff and some staff turnover. It's just not ready. Um, and it's a pretty significant thing in the preliminary plan rezoning. So that needs to be in good order before the, before it can come to the board. Um, so I want to recognize that Paul um, has made his way through planning and zoning. Um, that was a pretty productive meeting. Uh, it's also giving him time to take the input received from that uh, from that meeting to, and, and adjust his plans as well. So I think things will continue in a positive uh, direction with that. But yeah, we need to uh, push that out a bit. Um, I would recommend that the board cancel this public hearing uh, because we're not certain when it will be ready. So instead of moving it multiple times, um, I'd like to um, repost when it is when it is ready. So the staff recommendation would be to cancel the public hearing. Okay. Is there a motion to that effect? I just have one question on that. Is there any, anything we have to take into consideration for the, I think it was the DOLA grants they were trying to receive for this, like if we're canceling, pushing it out, like are there any time constraints on that? Uh, the primary DOLA application was not successful. They did make it to the final round. Um, they received a lot of positive feedback, but it was extremely competitive. And it really came down to the other projects were farther along in their entitlements. And so we kind of suspected that it was a little early in this project that that made it susceptible to not getting the funding. But um, since then, he's lined up a few additional grants and, and loans for the project. Um, to, he's still committed to the affordable aspect to the to the project. So it's also allowing time for the additional funding sources too. Okay. So no, I, I don't think by uh, pushing it out, he's anything's in jeopardy at this point. Okay. The funding standpoint. So is there a motion to cancel the public hearing? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Swisher, Rowe. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Um, I'd like to close the, the public hearing. And Philip, I have a question for you, or I think it would be for you. A couple of us have gotten a long uh, email from one of the residents of Crossman Avenue, um, bringing up issues with regard to the crossings project. But it's not something that we have any particular insight on. I don't know, did other trustees get a letter? Yeah. yeah. So um, I was wondering, Number one, whether we were in a quasi-judicial time period. Um, and then secondly, what should we do about these emails? I mean, it's, if we're in a quasi-judicial time period, then it's inappropriate for us to be communicating with the person. That's a great right? question. Um, Jeff's probably on and he might be able to speak to it. But I, I would say in general, it would be it would be good practice to encourage them to continue um, engaging staff. Um, there will also be a public hearing before the board for the preliminary plat and the rezoning, which is another opportunity for uh, for her to participate in the board in the process. Um, I would encourage the board not to get into a back and forth through email about it because, um, yeah, it's it's also a little early for some of those uh, questions. Um, that's the process that's working out now is uh, defining and clarifying a lot of those questions. So um, yeah, I don't know if Jeff 
wants to chime in as well, but that would be my recommendation is there's still plenty of steps in the process. Uh, for yeah, so Philip, you basically, uh, now you're wearing a fourth or fifth hat because you're providing uh, good legal advice. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it is a uh, quasi judicial matter. You know, the application has gone through the planning commission. It's going to be coming to the board of trustees it's just a matter of getting the review taken care of. So it's still in a quasi judicial setting, which means that you really can't be having correspondence uh, with the public or even the applicant outside of the public hearing. And so what Philip just said is perfectly on point. It's just the best advice to give people is thank you for your comments. You know, please come to the meeting uh, and participate when the public hearing um, is set and, and you can be heard at that point. And they can certainly come and talk to staff if they have questions and staff can maybe answer some questions and also refer them to the appropriate date when the public hearing is going to occur. Do you also want us to just refer them to staff at this point or not? <laughs> you know, it's really up to you. Oh, go ahead, Philip. You can answer that better than me. Um, uh, uh, she has. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So, yeah, I think that's still good practice and we'll, we'll continue to work with her and other residents that have questions. Okay. Oh, right. oh so she has communicated with you as well. Okay. Okay. We've also connected her with directly with Paul Andrews okay. because a lot of her questions are related to the work he's doing. So. Yeah. And just a heads up to the trustees, you know, try to be aware um, of whether something might be a quasi judicial matter, you know, before we jump in to try to, you know, respond to somebody's issues. Mm -hmm. really yeah, I, well, sorry, sorry, Mayor. Stop, stop. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Jeff. You're welcome. Okay, now we will hear from Cecilia LaFrance about the um, library expansion. Thanks for coming, Cecilia. Thank you for having me. Um, if anyone in the audience would like to be. Um, Philip, I'll offer you to do this presentation sure. if you wanted to. Happy to do it. Okay. Um, nice to see you. Um, thank you for letting me come and talk. My name is Cecilia LaFrance. I have the pleasure of running uh, the Vista Public Library. I'd like to introduce Kathy Keitel. She's a trustee on the board, also here tonight. Um, we are at a really exciting point, but before I jump in on that, I also want to echo Tom Rollins and thanking the town for all the support to get that stage out. Um, we had our summer reading kickoff there with a good 200 people, kids running around circus, going out literally. Um, and it was a lot of fun. That's a wonderful uh, addition to our, our to our community and just what a great venue. We've already booked it several times this summer. So thank you for that. Also, thank you for the support of a story walk that will be implemented in July. Uh, at the McBellamy Park. So that will just keep bringing literacy into the community. Thank you for that. Um, we're doing our own legacy work at the library and that's what I get to talk to you about tonight. And uh, I'll try to squish it all into a, a short and compact presentation. Um, thank you for those who came to some of our focus group meetings. Um, we've been trying to get the word out about um, what maybe, what our situation is, what our needs are and how we can, how we can solve some of those things to continue to make the library um, just a, a really great community resource, um, not just for Buena Vista because our service area is the Northern Chaffee County Library. So we follow the rule to clarify that, we follow the school district's boundary lines, 400 square, 461 square miles um, of service. So it's about 9,700 residents um, that uh, we serve in our area. Um, of that, we have about 5,000 card holders and those are active card holders. Um, and uh, we just downloaded our new card holder information and just had 83 in the past two weeks, new card holders. Our library is growing, our, our service area is growing, our population is growing, our popularity is growing. It's a wonderful problem um, to have. And uh, we have the um, honor to, to, to take it to the next level. Um, the town has always been involved in that. Um, to kind of show our history, 1888 it, it is the Buena Vista Public Library is formed, and since then it's just been growing. It was 1974 when we became a district, so we are funded through property tax revenues. Um, 
1995 is our last increase. Um, and then in 2005, we worked with the town here to uh, own our property in order to uh, tear down the old library and build a, build a new one. Um, it's quite amazing to be in the footsteps of people who 15 years ago, 17 years ago, knew we were gonna to need to grow. So they planned that building to host a second floor on the Northwest portion of the building, an additional 4,300 square feet on our existing 7,500 square feet. Um, we know that and we looked and said, How can, is it time? Um, can we solve our problems in another way? Um, and what are our problems? They're good problems, but you can see our annual use the visitor count that comes in, our circulation that um, has risen since 2006, um, programs. Um, the, the budget back then was pretty thin because they didn't go to the taxpayers in order to build that new building. So now we've been able to have all these great programs and people are loving it. As libraries evolve, we keep offering great services and we can see how they're being used. Um, our, our population has changed. In 2005, the director had pitched the new library uh, about from a community that's mostly retired. Um, that's not true anymore. Um, last year, our number one growth in card holders it was age 30 to 39. And so people are coming, they're bringing their families. This is a great place to raise kids and things. But when they come into, more than two families come into the library uh, children's room, we're at capacity and it's it's just really, really full. So we know that's one of our main needs to solve for. The other thing is just popularity. Um, we have a town full of readers uh, and, and it's great. I can't wait to have more time to read to it, but um, eBooks and books, popularity are, um, uh, the costs of everything keep going up as everybody else is experiencing, um, as well as the, the roles we, we we filled. Um, we've literally taken off the last wall that we could add more shelves to because when we did our strategic um, planning a few years ago, uh, people said they want more books. They We do have most of our, our people who come in browse our shelves like a bookstore um, rather than put their items on hold. They want to see those books on the shelves. So we want to respond to that and we want to add more books and people want those we're just tapped at this point to add more shelves. So something would have to give. Um, as far as like our, our other spaces that are used, um, people need a place to study. They need a free place to come sit and read or meet people. They have, um, we have providers who come and meet with their clients or um, students and things like that. So we've added study rooms. We added two study rooms in 2021 with a uh, CARES Act grant. Those things were booked 1,400 times last year, and we're already going to surpass that this year. We're already over 800 and it's halfway through. Um, so it's a good problem, like I said, um, but I want to kind of go, how do we plan on fixing that? Um, we want to solve all the problems because if we say one is greater than the other, um, we're cheating some of our, for some of our services, um, some of our demographics. Um, and so we have a plan for that. If we go to that second floor, which is what we're, we're intending to do, we did look at, can we expand on our existing footprint? And if you've been at the library, there's not much room to grow on that lot. Um, we're at capacity. We, we could add about 300 square feet to a really ridiculous price tag. And so we're public stewards of, or stewards of the public money. That's not what we're gonna spend that on. Um, we did look, can we build somewhere else? You know, could we have a one story somewhere else? Um, we got an initial price tag on that above 12 and a half million. And we just backed right away from that. <laughs> that's, that's not feasible either. Um, so we are back at that second floor because that's what the plan was. It is, it is feasible. It's a um, adding 4,300 square feet on that Northwest portion um, would comes to a price tag of 40, excuse me, 4.5 million. Um, that includes a, a complete renovation of the bottom space so that we can adjust our service spaces down there. 
It also includes the cost of all HVAC upgrades, which we're in for, up for in three years anyways. And we'd like to really capitalize on some of the um, energy incentives that are out there and go green. Um, we could fit the solar arrays on our new roof and that makes sense to do it at that timing. So we're not having to tear off a roof later um, down the lane. We wanna to move to heat pump technology and really reduce our footprint as well as this could lead to a potential $10,000 a year in energy cost savings. Um, the, this would also include that, that price tag also includes staying open. So we would do the impossible, which is look for lease space in this town. <laughs> Sorry, no one's laughing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we would try to keep a lease space so that we could keep our services and um, time it so that it'd be in the months where we could host some of our programs, maybe outside or at other venues, so that we're, we'll have some continuity in our services to uh, for library. Um, what are we looking at for space? And this, this becomes very exciting. Uh, we already know what kind of spaces we need growth in. And then we've been talking with community leaders, community organizations to see what else do they picture in this space because this is unique and, and libraries and communities can fill in gaps. And we already kind of do that in certain ways. Um, we, our adult education programs, our classes are, are full. They are, are wait lists, we get wait lists on those um, and people want more. Our budget doesn't allow it right now, but that's what we'd like to plan for. Um, part of it, I have a youth service coordinator and adult service coordinator stepping on each other's toes to rent, to reserve our meeting room space so they can host their classes. So we know that we would like to add another classroom space. This classroom space would be large enough to host either one of our programs and then we'd also want it to be able to host community because we have um, groups that come use our meeting space. As you know, at the town, they try to use this meeting space. And we heard that in our stakeholder interviews that people want more places to meet. Um, so this would allow another space for community when we're not using it for them to host their, um, their meetings and groups. Um, we want to solve for that children's room. If we move a lot of our services and spaces upstairs, um, we would expand and relocate on the first floor and close in and make a larger children's library. Um, we're really good at needing zero, zero through five um, age group. And then when they start to hit that elementary school, um, they grow into our shelves on the other side, but it's just a tight room and we don't have a lot of seating areas in that space. We also try to have early literacy engagement stations, uh, which are really important in development and find motor skills and socialization. And so those are also in that children's room. So our plan would be to add a whole, you know, over 400 square feet to the children's room, which would allow us to really hit all of those age demographics. We would make that first floor the, the convenience, what people come into the library for and only spend you know, 10 to 15 minutes. They come in, they drop off their books, they pick up their holds, um, they print something off, they look something up on the computer, print their Amazon returns, things like that. Um, those be on that first floor of easy access. We also would keep the children's down there so we don't necessitate people to go upstairs or an elevator with a stroller and a baby carriage and things. So keeping those easy convenience things on that first floor. Things that people stay longer for, study rooms. We currently have two study rooms. And if you would, um, do you have our website too? It's okay if not, um, where we actually have kind of a blueprint <laughs> design. Um, this is not final design, it's just a proposal. It's on your website. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I think it's exciting. And if you're a visual person, it's a great way to see it. Um, but what we would do is move our study rooms upstairs. Currently, we have two four people study rooms. We Those are very popular, but we also see that most of the time it's just one or two people in our study rooms. They need the Zoom meetings, they need the this quiet study, they need the private meeting with someone, um, and that's what they're using them for. So what we would do is we would add three more study rooms up in that upper space. Those, they're low maintenance. We don't need a lot of staff to watch those and people can access those and use those, just need someone there to help. 
Yep, there we go. That's our first floor uh, is our proposed remodel of the first floor. So everything in the green would be touched in new. Um, we would be able to expand our collection by 20%, um, both in the kids collection and in the adult collection by moving our computers and our study rooms upstairs. Um, if you'd switch to the next layout, to just, this is a proposed space. There's fun photos that kind of show cubbies and uh, fun seating, tangible, um, movable furniture for kids. Um, we could actually host small classes and groups in this, in this space, uh, which would just be wonderful to have some of the schools come over. Because when they do come over from either the public school or Darren Patterson, that room becomes very tight. <laughs> um, so this space would be just ideal and allow us to um, have more interactions and support for the schools. The next is the second floor. And um, the lower portion of that is that great collegiate peak view. Um, so we call that the range view. Um, these are just architect terms here. Um, and all of that big main room there would be flexible kind of area. So imagine furniture that could easily be rolled out of the way for a big community talk. Um, Tom Rollins, who's already left, already came and expressed his interest in having a stage in that area. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that far-fetched. It really isn't. We could have a raised platform like they have at the high school, have some seating on it, and move it out when we do have a performance. So this is a wonderful proposed space right there, that main room. Uh, moving our computers up there for people who are doing their computer work. We would add that second classroom on the uh, left side there, which is the north side of the building. Um, this we could host our classes and those community events. We've heard that maybe 15 seating for 15 isn't enough. Um, so we are going to probably go back to the drawing board with that to see how we could accommodate a few more uh, seats in there. But there's a lot of room, as you can see. Um, the upper portion, you'll see those study rooms um, and you jump over next to it is a tech lab. If you've been to some of the bigger front range libraries, uh, maker spaces are huge. We are aware of some other maker space things there and we're talking with them because we're not trying to compete. We're filling in gaps. So it wouldn't be anything that we try to overlap. Whereas there's a maker space group trying to go for more machinery and things like that. Ours would be more like technology skills um, and other things that the community might need, whether it be like a photo booth station with a high quality camera and photoing and lighting so people can then take pictures for all their individual home crafts that they sell. We have a lot of entrepreneurs in the, in the community. That's just one idea. Um, we already have a small tech lab and that would move up there with that equipment as well. That far corner, um, this is to solve a problem that we see. We do have providers in our community and some providers that are in the south side of the county that come up to meet with people at the library. Um, these are kind of sometimes heartbreaking stories, uh, whether it's meeting with uh, veterans uh, with PTSD and things like that. Right now they're meeting in glass study rooms and these can be very private um, consultations. So we would design this room for the first priority for um, organizations and providers who wanna meet with people in the community. Um, we would also look at having the telehealth equipment in here uh, so that people could have a high quality telehealth appointment or follow-up consultations with specialists and doctors rather than what we see, which is people on their cell phone um, with that kind of quality. There's great technology out there where you can make your doctor the size of that screen and the camera can show them that high quality um, definition and such. So we'd like to have that service as well. Um, it has a whole greater dimension of what we're currently doing and then other things we'd like to do in the future. And it sets this library up to grow for the next 20 years. Um, so you've already heard the price tag on it. Um, I kind of want to talk um, our, our funding plans. I've been able to talk to six grant funders who are uh, highly in favor of this. They do like to see community support. Um, and by adding 4,300 square feet, our operating costs would go up. Um, so we would need community support in order to, um, to fund this long-term. Um, we have reserves and we would throw um, the good portion of the, our reserves at the, at the bill. 
um, but we would have to go to the community to ask for an increase in our bill. Um, so right now, because the property tax rates came back so high or property valuations came back so high, it actually knocked down what we'd have to offer. And we're looking at, and this is still being decided based on once they figure out um, the overall revenue projections for next year. Um, but right now we're looking at about a 1.2 uh, mil ask for the community this fall at, uh, on November's election. Um, that equals about $8 in, uh, uh, per 100,000 in your residential uh, valuation. Um, I'd say average cost, but there is no such thing <laughs> in our community. So um, that's where we're at. We were, we've had focus groups, we've had community input, um, overwhelming majority of support. Um, a few people concerned about, you know, additional taxes and things like that. Um, the reminder of this is just that this is a service that is, um, gives right back to the community. Um, and it's for all ages uh, that we serve. So again, trying to represent uh, what, what's needed for the library and what we see that people want out of it. Any questions? That's great. It sounds ambitious and yet doable. I mean, that, that's not a huge increase in, in taxes that people would have to pay to, to support it. You'd need to have a really good campaign ready to go and not drop in at the last minute like some campaigns. We're looking for volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good, yeah, good project. project. Be a first class library. Yeah, I think it's great. I grew up being a heavy user of the library in my town. Great to see expansion and Simon for the whole community. So I use the ebooks a lot or the audio books when I'm traveling and driving. So that's super nice to have. Thank you. And I appreciate all you've done to really suss out what what the community wants and needs, that's that's huge. Yeah, the, the classes have been really great. Um, something I don't know if everybody's aware of, but definitely having the guests come in for topics and having classes there have been really nice. We're enjoying it, it's fun. Figuring out how to pay for my daughter's college, it was great. <laughs> Some experts there to yes. counsel me and I can now tell Joel what I learned there. <laughs> Thank you for letting me come tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia. So the next item that we have is um, a discussion of our town administrator hiring process. And um, Guy, since you're possibly going to put it in an application, I would appreciate you giving us um, some private time right now for about half an hour. Excellent. Well, this is this, these are your last issues for your meeting, correct? Right. Okay. Well, no. Um, there are some other issues, but they all they all kind of deal with these <laughs> this topic. Okay. Um, then I will. Yes. I will. Right. I'll what you do for the evening. Okay. Thank you. It's yeah. nice that you came to the meeting. Appreciate it. Nice meeting. See you again. Okay, so we are in the process of um, having a search for a new town administrator. And um, Philip, do you wanna read this or? Um, I'll start it off. Um, Jeff's on as well. I, I think I asked him to do a chunk of the um, introduction to this. I'll just say that staff did put together a memo summarizing the process and what needs to be discussed and determined hopefully this evening by the board. Um, Jeff is, is our expert on the process and uh, is not my process. I wanna make it clear. So uh, Jeff, if you don't mind, maybe giving an overview of what the board needs to, to discuss tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I'll just summarize, yeah, it's, it's not Philip's process. And um, 
uh, the way that it's set up, it's, it's under state statute. And it's interestingly, the provisions of the open meetings law basically require that a certain process be followed when you're hiring the town administrator. Um, I did provide a memo and I believe that most of the uh, information uh, in the packet sort of goes through it, but I'll just give you a, a real brief summary of what's required. Um, so basically the board that you has to set what's called the job search goals. And you know, those include you know, the qualifications, the duration, the time frame for applications, sort of the general process. And that's basically covered by Philip's memo here. Um, once that's done, there's an application period that's followed. And then you know, by the end of the you know, deadline's already been set. So all the applications come in during that deadline. And then there's a review of the applications process. And there's a number of ways to do it, but um, the suggestion in uh, the staff memo is that it be done by a committee with two board members on that committee. Because if you have three board members on the committee, then you end up having a public meeting. So it's usually better to protect the privacy of the applicants during the initial review process. So that's one reason why it's, it's better to do it with just two board members uh, and a committee. Um, ultimately, um, you know, part of this period could be, part of that process could be uh, interviewing candidates, providing sort of recommendations to the, to the larger board of who should be a finalist. And the law has changed in the last few years, but um, you can have only one person be a finalist or multiple individuals be a finalist. And it sort of depends upon what you think is appropriate. It's up to the board to decide, you know, what, what should be, who should be finalists. Um, once you decided who the finalists are, whether that's one individual or a group of individuals, you have to publish their names. And um, uh, that can be done a number of ways in the paper or it can be on your, on your website, but you publish the names and then you have a, what's called like a 14 day waiting period. Uh, after you've published the finalist names, you cannot actually select or make a job offer until that 14 day period is, has uh, expired. Um, ultimately, once an offer is made, you can do a couple ways to do that too. Um, I, I, but generally there's a negotiation period where an individual from staff or an individual from the committee, the, you know, the, the hiring committee will negotiate the employment terms. And then the formal decision to hire and to approve an employment contract with the town administrator is done via a public meeting by the entire board. And I know in the past that when you've basically had one or more finalists, you've sort of had an open house. And that's also addressed in your memo where basically the individuals can answer questions uh, in a public setting. And that's totally appropriate too. It's just up to the board. So there's a number of ways to skin the cat, but generally it's, you know, set your job search goals, Applications get submitted, they get reviewed, um, and then one or more finalists is selected, and then the list of the finalists is published, and then the successful candidate is selected via an open house or however you want to do it, and then a final employment agreement is basically negotiated and then approved by the board in the end, and then you have your new town administrator. Um, hopefully that wasn't too quick. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, um, but that's generally the process required by the open meetings law. Thank you. So we have some items that we need to decide tonight. Um, one of them is a job description. And I think you've all received a draft of a job description. Um, and Peter had one change that he wanted to recommend. I don't know if anyone else has any any changes, but um, Peter, do you have that? Do you have your wording on that? Yeah, so there's actually two things. One was um, the education and background requirement, uh, or I have to get this phrase, um, but that section there, the education experience, they have, we have the three to five years experience in a municipal or county government uh, including experience finance, or is there a way we could add to that um, is uh, highly preferred but not required? Because right now it almost looks like, you know, unless you've had three to five years, you don't really qualify for this. 
the only reason I ask that is cast a wider net that we can maybe get um, kind of a non-traditional candidate where like for me looking at this next town administrator, I'm really kind of zeroing in on somebody who knows how to hire and manage teams and have a real team mentality and keeping keep folks focused. And so you can have that experience and those soft skills and background, but maybe you don't have a municipal and county background. That was my thought process on that. Mm -hmm. um, Cause like Philip, I don't know, did you have, were you on the board for more than three years? I was on the board for five years. Uh, okay. Yeah. I know those. Yeah. I don't know, but I think some non traditional just keeping it open there. And then, you know, obviously when we're going through the resumes and everything, you could say it doesn't really qualify, but. I mean, my, just to share, I mean, my experience was from the private sector and managing organizations and teams and HR and finance. And so that resonates, although my connection to the job itself was the time. Right. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, I think I, I've, I've definitely seen job descriptions that emphasize it as a, a preference. Um, but not making it mandatory just just because you might get a dynamic candidate that checks a lot of boxes but may, may miss that one and our hands are kind of tied if we're following our own. Yeah, I, I thought it was a very good suggestion. Yeah, I'm, I'm maybe just changing it instead of a minimum to say a recommendation of three to five years or something like that. Yeah, the wording side, basically I just don't want anybody to feel like, well, I can't apply for that because I don't have this. Right. That could be an interesting candidate that even if we don't go with them would be an interesting person to kind of kind of go through that process mm -hmm. to, um, to the full type candidate. I don't know. I, I do like the highly preferred though. Yeah, highly preferred, just not required. Yeah. Yeah. Or again, some wording of that. Mm -hmm. to, because um, it definitely is a huge benefit, and obviously, you know, it is preferred, but they're, like I said, they're, right, you could get a candidate. Strong that's dynamic leader yeah. that could yeah. be decent. Was there another change? The only other, <laughs> and I, I didn't know how much we were going to get into a discussion here about this, but if we do have more of a discussion of what we're looking for <laughs> and if we're making any changes, is a link to the job in the job description, like a hyperlink to this board meeting of if you want to. A greater detail about our process in this, you know, that Jeff just walked through, or um, more nuance of what we're looking for. And also, could just if somebody actually watches it, we know they're really dedicated and want the job. Just an idea, because I, I know this goes to YouTube, I think tomorrow or something. So there's a hyperlink you can add to the JD. Just an idea. If somebody can make it through a meeting, <laughs> should we give them the six-hour one? <laughs> Make it required viewing. I'm telling you, man, that water, the two hour water meeting was enough. <laughs> I think, well, I, I think they could find their way. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but I do like the first change. <laughs> one thing, or can I? Yes, go, go ahead, Sue. Um, the one thing I, I always struggled with hiring for a municipality is the wage range because a lot of people have their eye on that highest figure. And so we started putting in the, sort of a starting salary. It's more likely to be in a certain range, but I don't know if you can really do that without confusing the issue. It's just, um, you know, just trying to conserve the town's money. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, Jeff, I don't know if it's law yet. I know in a lot of places you have to post the uh, the pay range. I don't know if that's hit Colorado yet or not. Do you know? Yeah, it has. Um, so what we've started doing, and first of all, or not first of all, but I do want to point out um, kudos to Paula and Lillian uh, for jumping on, creating an amazing looking yeah. nice like that. advertisement that's good. Yeah. in a very, very short order. Um, Kind of blew my mind, but uh, <laughs> that was great uh, having our our uh, uh, board good. chart in there and things yeah. like that. Just it means we're ready to go whenever the board finalizes these details. So um, I like the elf picture too. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, kind of <laughs> adding language around. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to base it on qualifications and what the candidate brings. Um, but you're right, inevitable, that's, it's there, it catches the eye. Sure. But it sounds like 
that's, the, I mean, just the clarification, the qualifications, that's the best we can do, I think. <laughs> Anybody else have um, changes that they wanted to see? Um, I was wondering about on the second page of the job title, overseas professional and consulting service services agreements entered into by the town, including engineering, architectural, financial, and legal agreements. And now we have technology too as a category, I think. Yeah, and I think that has is still under the oversight section, not like the, Yeah, we spelled it out here um, where there's supervision. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And then there's oversight. And we actually moved town treasurer, town clerk, judge under oversight because technically the board has higher fire direct supervision of those positions. But uh, as you stated, Mayor, we have information, instead of a uh, department head, we have it as a oversight. Um, we could also yeah, clarify. Where I was looking at was the fourth bullet point down from the top of the page. Overseas professional and consulting services. Yeah, 35, yeah. Anybody else have comments they want to make about the job description? It's good. It's Add good. anything, take anything away, elaborate. That's great. Okay, yeah, I think it's really good too. Okay, so that was one thing. We're good on that. Um, and then um, it's going to be advertised at various places. Um, I noticed you have the Chaffee County Times in there. How about the Arc Valley Voice? Should it be a source for an ad also? And then um, does anyone, you know, I'm out of date. I have no idea where, where you should advertise. I have heard of Indeed and LinkedIn. <laughs> Are there other type job things like that? Like there used to be monster jobs. And I don't know. What Usually when you know. post up one of those, they kind of go to all of them because they okay. kind of scan to see what jobs are out there. I mean, there are industry specific, but I think that'd be like CML would have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, CCCMA, the Colorado City and County Management Association is where a lot of specific town administrator, town manager jobs are posted for the state. Um, ICMA is also one of those industry specific and CML, of course. Okay. Um, deadline for applications. I think uh, Ju uh, July 6th, 2023 at 5 p.m. And then uh, requirements for the applicants, cover letter, town application and resume. So then in a separate business item, we're going to address the distance that they can live from. Correct. Uh -huh. But you can discuss it now. But yes, okay. we do have that as an agenda item. Okay, right now our municipal code says that they have to reside within a 15-minute normal drive time radius of the town hall and in no event greater than 15 miles therefrom throughout their term of office. Board of Trustees may waive this requirement at its discretion. So we're, you know, we'd actually probably be covered even if we didn't change it, but uh, we've discussed changing it. Um, so now or later, we should have the board weigh in on that. Yeah, we want to be clear up front with applicants about that requirement. So yeah, we definitely want the board to 
weigh in on it? Yeah, we're thinking maybe 30 minutes, 30 minute drive time or 30 miles. We could just, well, I was gonna say, just say within JV County, but I guess Ranch of the Rockies was mentioned last time as a- Yeah, Granite. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Ranch of the would be more likely, but Granite also. <laughs> They don't want for sale right now. I mean, <laughs> I, I, and for my part, I'm totally on board with that. Yeah, I'm totally fine. I, I guess I just try to cover whatever might be a, you know, it's 35, to 31 miles or whatever. But yeah. I actually don't know what mileage is from here to like the furthest part of, say, Pancha or. Yeah, and to Leadville, it is probably around 35 miles. So it can be a different number, could be 40 miles. I think we also changed it last time, right? Once we kind of got a town administrator. So if we need to adjust it a mile or two, what's up? Commuting from Leadville in the winter is not half hour. So with it within <laughs> the mileage, though, if we, if we had a larger number. I think that's. Fine, half hour, 30 miles. Okay. Anybody else have an opinion on it? 30 miles, 40 miles. Leave it alone. Yeah, I think 30 is good. I mean, I, I, again, like what Devin said, if we find somebody in there at 35 and it's the candidate we want, we could change it again, I assume, but this at least lets people know. That it's yeah. outside of the town. Yeah, that they don't have to live out in the center. Okay. Um, is there a motion to change the municipal code to state a 30 mile, uh, a 30, 30 minute normal drive time and in no event greater than 30 miles? I still move. Okay. I'll second. We have Cobb and Roe. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is anyone opposed? The motion passes. So we'll bring a, an ordinance at the next meeting, um, probably in consent agenda, but we'll put it in consent uh, at the next meeting. Okay. For that. Thank you. Okay. Um, then we have the selection procedures. I've heard from trustees that they would like to be more involved in the application review process. Um, our attorney has advised us that it's not necessarily wise for us to have all of the trustees on the selection, the search committee. So uh, we thought that um, it would work out well if we had all the trustees review all of the applications and give their opinion to the search committee. And the search committee would have um, some staff people on it and two members of the board of trustees. So um, it would have um, Philip and Paula, this is our recommendation anyway, Philip and Paula and Shane and um, Dean and- John. John. So that's um, our interim administrator and treasurer, the clerk, um, the police chief, the recreation uh, director, and the HR director. Let me, I thought you mentioned in your email that Sean, not Shane. Yeah, but it's not. I was mistaken. Okay. It should have been Shane. Okay. I mean, in my opinion, it should have been Shane. Okay. Um, I mean, I just didn't, I mean, public works is a major part of the job. I just didn't know why, nothing against Shane, but a director on what is essentially the biggest department seems to be, but I, I mean, yeah. I don't know your call, I just didn't know what you thought meant. 
Well, yeah. those even at the time. Or yeah, that's what I can't say. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, keep things it's, running. it's mainly a time consideration, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sure he would be willing to do it mm -hmm. if the board would feel more comfortable with him. Um, it doesn't even have to be in replace. It, Shane could still participate. Um, Shane's been through a couple of administrators, so I think he's got some good perspective. Yeah. He does. So, um, yeah, but it's it was mainly just Sean's running around with his hair on fire. Cool. Uh, let's let's give him <laughs> something. Okay, yeah, that's fair. I was just yeah. It stood out to me, uh, just given the the weight of that department, that it makes sense, but it also makes sense if he's totally tied up, tied up, not having more constraints on him. So what we would do in terms of the schedule that I envision is we would have um, the applications have a deadline of July 6th from the 7th to the 9th, all of the trustees review all of the applications. Then um, on the 10th and 11th, let's see, let me get back to my schedule. Okay. 10th and 11th, the search committee uses the trustee input and their own opinions to select those candidates that they feel should be interviewed. So that, that whole responsibility fits up on the search committee at that point. Um, and we'll try to come up with a um, some sort of a scoring sheet, a rubric for us to use as trustees in um, giving our input to the search committee. So what we've been doing is we set up a Google, a Google form or Google sheet um, that has a rubric and an explanation of how, how to evaluate and based, based on what all that stuff. Um, and then it, it accumulates, it forms everybody, everything into a final kind of summary sheet. Um, but that would allow the board and the committee as applications come in, you can go in, look at it, Put you know document your input and not wait till the end because ideally it would be nice. I don't think we're going to receive any applications like right at the end of that deadline. Hopefully not. Um, but if we could get input as we're moving along, we can keep moving on this timeline. So so it wouldn't necessarily all happen on those three days, um, but we would also be able to go back and change our answers, right? Absolutely. Because you might, you know, as you as you review more of them, you might become more sensitive to certain areas. Okay. So then um, the search committee on the 12th of July, the search committee would notify the applicants that they will be interviewed and, and set up the interviews. And the interviews would take place in the following week, the 17th to the 19th. Um, and hopefully they would be in-person interviews here in Buena Vista. There might be some, you know, exception, like somebody's in Antarctica or someplace <laughs> where they have to participate by Zoom. But, um, but we would definitely prefer in-person interviews. Um, and then on the 20th, having done those interviews, the search committee would decide on who the finalists are. And if I'm, it may be one finalist or it may be several. Um, then on the 21st, the town will publish the list of the finalists. Um, and on the 25th, then the finalists will come to the board of trustees and they will make a presentation um, of themselves to the board of trustees and to the public. Sometimes we've had them do a little project that they present like it's a real project or, or they may just talk about what their qualifications or you know, we can decide later how, what that means for them to present to the board of trustees. But it's important um, because uh, right after that, we will go into executive session and we will give negotiation instructions to um, our attorney to negotiate with the person that we choose as our, our uh, 
choice for the administrator. I have to go back real quickly to the evaluation of the applications real quickly, just because <clears throat> I just want to clarify the there's a Google Doc that will have all of will have an evaluation sheet, but it'll also have a, like a Google folder has all the applications. Correct. Correct. And that won't be available to us until the seventh. No, but we will be able to see it ahead of time. As got to come in. That's what you're saying to the. Hopefully, won't come in the last one. Got just I have family in town. Seventh night. Tenth yeah. Month. So, <laughs> right. Okay. Jumping out at me. Great. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So this tie, tries to not tie things down to a particular day. In most cases. I would I would add that there's an alternative to the schedule if by the twenty first. Uh, the com or 20th, uh, if the committee doesn't feel like we have the appropriate finalists, I think at the 25th board meeting, that would be the update, right? So, um, yeah, we're really entrusting the committee to evaluate do we have the appropriate finalists or finalists to come before the board? If we don't, then we don't. All right. Um. One, one thing I um, recall from the last search that um, we did was a second a second interview, a second Zoom interview. Um, That's true. And so we that it, there's not a lot of time to fit that in um, if if the search committee wants to do it for one or more candidates. But there might it might there might still be a way, or we could figure that out somehow. Because that's just, uh, yeah, it's a pretty fast timetable if, if we needed a second. The significance of publishing the list of finalists is um, that that starts a 14-day period okay. in which we cannot make an offer to anybody. Can, can, could we do a second interview during that time? Jeff? Yeah, you can, do, you can do as many interviews as you want. Um, because the finalist isn't actually your selection. So, okay. you know, once you've basically published a list of finalists, it's sort of up to you how you want to proceed with vetting those people. Okay. So we could continue to ask them questions or the search committee could, yeah. That, that's right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Then, um, real quick, sorry, Olivia. Yeah. Following up on what uh, Philip, you mentioned of on the 25th is when it would be announced that we couldn't find uh, the applicant, like if the search committee decides we couldn't find it. Um, I guess one thing I just, I guess we don't need to have this as an official timeline or anything, but uh, it's a conversation we had previously about maybe more executive sessions before that occurs. Some, some way to have an honest and frank conversation like this is where we're at. And so everybody has equal buy-in to the process who are maybe not part of the search committee. That makes sense. But I guess we wouldn't have time before the 25th to do that. Um, well, I guess if you, if, the, if there are finalists announced and through that public presentation and, and Q and A, what, however that's structured. If the board goes in an executive session and the group's not ready to select a finalist find a candidate to negotiate with i think that's also a direction okay. um so i guess the question sorry the question would be kind of going back to if the committee doesn't feel like we have finalists is the board comfortable with the committee kind of holding to that decision and coming before the board on the 25th saying through the interview process we don't feel like we have the right candidates yet um is the board okay accepting that or does the board want to i guess see the finalists i the, the 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 crux to me is though once you say here are the finalists then it's public those people's names are shared sure it is a pretty significant step so i guess yeah and, and maybe it's a the committee makes the decision and then we have an executive session on the day that you know that's presented that we don't have any finalists to then give an overview to everybody else of this is what the search committee we went through all these names we talked to these folks and this is why we kind of came to it so folks names aren't public but i think that way other board members understand like 
kind of what's the talent pool dealing with? What are the constraints? Why are, what are the roadblocks that we're facing? Just so again, I think that way everybody on the board has a full understanding of what the search committee was working with, if that makes sense. I just think that would be yeah. helpful. I like that idea. Thanks. So I know that was one thing that I kind of was facing a lot of times. Like, yeah. Well, what were all the others? Like, because we were part of that. And yeah. So I just think it'd be helpful to add clarity to that on where everybody's coming from, if that's where it reached. But again, it doesn't have to be an official thing, but just to keep in mind, if that's the route we go, it'd be yeah. helpful to learn that. So that would mean we'd have to do something um, sort of on the late the 20th or the, early the 21st, right? If we if we didn't feel like we were ready to announce finalists. Well, or you're talking about- I'm saying like, I'm fine. Like if the search committee is saying we didn't find them, then I don't think the board's yeah. like, oh, what do you mean? These people are great. Okay. So it's like, yeah, we didn't find them. But then later that session, if that's the way it goes, having an executive session for a debrief with everybody else mm -hmm. on the board to let us know why. And because then we have an idea of how we need to address the new search or search for everybody else and what the constraints are, but we at least know what was actually going sure. on. Jeff, could the board have an executive session to discuss that if we don't have finalists announced? Yeah, it's basically for negotiations and strategy for negotiations. So that would be an appropriate basis to do that. So would we have to call a special meeting and then go into executive session? I mean, you, you, you have to do an executive session in either a regular or a special meeting, so. Okay. So we'd have to call a special meeting. Or we could do it the 25th. Oh, yeah, okay. I was saying, like, doing that day is fine. I just, uh, I'm mean, probably okay. on the search committee, so it'd be nice to know why it broke down, if that's the case, but hopefully that's not the case, because we found great finalists and, yeah, we can move forward with it. But it would just be good to know that information so that we all are on the same page. So, so you're not saying that you want to hash out how the, the finalists were achieved. Do you want to have that conversation only if we don't, or we, the committee doesn't reach? Yeah, I mean, mainly my whole thought on this came about when it feels like this search committee would say that we couldn't find a finalist. Okay. We do that on the fifth, yeah. the fifth, and I'm like, and so my mind just automatically went, wait, we couldn't find anybody? Why? What would yeah, happen? Yeah, and gotcha. so gotcha. it'd be good to know okay. that because we have to then reevaluate how we're going to find a new town administrator. And I think yeah. it'd be good for everybody on the board to know why. Did. That was the breakdown. Yeah. So regardless, it sounds like an exact session on the 25th would make sense either way. I think so too, actually. That'd yeah. be very helpful, yeah. yeah. And like the thought process behind why these are the finalists, mm -hmm. if we did find some folks. Makes sense. And if that doesn't happen, then on the 8th, we can hire a person. So, do the dates seem okay to people in general? And yes. we need to figure out who is going to be on the search committee along with the staff people. So I ask that um, in coming to this meeting tonight that you be prepared to let us know about your availability for reviewing applications on that three day period, but it will really, you can start earlier than that, but to be done by the 9th of July. So first of all, is everybody available in that time period? I, I can be available. Okay. And this is something you can do anywhere because um, you'll just keep feeding us applications, right? Yeah, Jonna, Jonna will be the point person for okay. communication with applicants. She'll be the one uploading to the Google Drive, and then that'll send out emails to the board and to the committee that, that that's been accepted or received. Okay. So, so each application will get an email. Yep. Knowing that there's a new one. Okay, cool. But the... Um, the actual interviews, though, people would have to be present. I mean, the first folks think so. Yeah. Okay. So then, secondly, um, do you want to be considered for being on the search committee? And if you're on the search committee, it means that you will be able to um, participate from. It's the reason. Well, okay. So it'll be through the eleventh of July 
and then again from the 17th to the 20th. So, so it was silence question? is deafening. So, so, so what's I the cannot join, please. So I just, I'm hoping I have a new job at this point. I don't know what my schedule will be. And if I'm not, then I have to be looking and right, answer a higher power of my wife. And she said, <laughs> you can't phone too for anything else. So, <laughs> so. She's got you tied up. Yes. I see. Maybe she wants to be. No, just no, no, we want to live here. I, I could. I'm I'm available. I mean, I've, I've got the time and I'm available and I'd be interested, but I also, okay. you know, was on the last one. So I kind of. Yeah, I could make it work. Okay. If, but I'm not like, if someone else really wants to do it, I'm flexible. I don't feel like I have to. Okay. But, our shop is so short on help right now. It would be, it wouldn't be considerate to my husband to leave him there to do it all. And we, counting Ed and I, we have two and a half employees right now. So it definitely would be, during our busiest point, it would be a conflict. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm I'm from Gina, I'm too. Gina. I think she'd be interested in being on it, but I don't know what her schedule is. Yeah. Hmm. And I guess we don't have to know that tonight, right? Um, not necessarily, although we do advertise tomorrow. So I would love, I mean, I guess the whole board's getting the notifications on the application. So not necessarily now. We could we could take a little more time identifying those two and then everybody will be looking at the applications anyway. I mean, I'd kind of like to do it, but I don't want to, you know, push somebody else out of the way, especially you. No, you should do it. <laughs> if you want to do it, do it. I don't know if my... With my work schedule, I'd have to take off time, which means I'm not making money. Um, but I would do it for the greater good. And I'm not making money anyway, so. Yeah, so you, yeah, you have all the time in the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> what, about, what about these jobs? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if they, we don't make this one decision today, I mean, one is hold on until we're all here. Or, for Gina, I mean, because I don't know what her schedule is, but I'm fine with whatever. I'd, I'd support having Sue and Libby as the people. We also haven't heard from Gina, so. <laughs> well, well, it sounds like we don't need to know yeah, exactly okay, right now. Right. Take yeah, it say, I'm glad we're all going to be able to see the applicants, though. Yeah, you know, I think that's have key. that kind of yeah. oversight on really right. that visual into the process. Do you agree with that, Jeff? That we don't have to know it tonight. No, no, that's not that's not required for the uh, the step. Okay, cool. Um, will you all wait till the next meeting then to discuss that? Is that the what I'm hearing? Does it have to be at a a, a, a board action or can it be worked out? It can be worked out. I don't think we, I don't think we need a motion or anything like that. Just I think we want to make sure we get the right next meeting, but don't decide right now. Okay. That's what it sounds like. Okay. Paula, were you gonna say something? We'll be good. Okay. Okay. Let me let me do say so Sue Cobb, you're a firm, yes. So it's the second member we're waiting on, correct? And that's okay with me. Yeah. Okay, so Sue's a firm, yes. So okay. Sound like Libby, you wanted to do it. So yeah, I'd like to do it. Well, let's have Libby do it then. All right. Good. <laughs> and then it's that's done. Easy. Deal. Oh, and it's okay. done. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so do we want to have a motion to that effect? That Sue and Libby will be on the search committee. 
Do you need a motion for that? Yeah, I think that's optional. It's up to the board. Okay. All right. Okay. Let the minutes reflect <laughs> that Sue Cobb and Libby Bay will be on the search committee with the five staff members. Jeff, are you comfortable with where we've concluded on all those aspects? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. So those interviews are actually, it's actually the 18th to the 20th. Correct. Okay. And all the trustees will see the applicants. So nobody's really getting left out. Right. We will get to respond. So nobody's getting left yeah. out. So, it yeah. should be good so it's a different process than last time. Yeah. Right. Okay. But we didn't see anything right. until the final. Yeah. This is good. All that helped with that idea. I think that's a good, good change to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, that. I think. I think that's all. Um. Okay. We already did the residency requirement. Yes. Okay. So now we have item E which is the interim town administrator plan. And um, Philip has very capably and willingly been um, filling in as uh, not only the treasurer, he's been doing the treasurer job, but also uh, taking on many of the responsibilities of the administrator. So, um, it seems very reasonable that he would expect to be compensated for that extra work. Before you get just like that question about the agreement, some of the language in there, not the compensation part, but the responsibilities, just the, I think I read the first part of it that you would be, it says taking on like the search for a town planner and the planning department. I didn't know what is the thought that there were holding off on any growth or any hiring so i thought that was on pause the town planner position until we get a new administrator or are you still going through that process so we're we are uh do you want me to go into because i was going to share some interim thoughts as well oh, okay. Okay. So, so i can start in on that now if you yeah. want mm -hmm. okay so um we are putting out an rfp for planning and engineering services first um to see what's available to us um, for that. Right now we do have RG and associates for that, um, but that's been about 10 years we've worked with them and this is a good opportunity um, while we're starting fresh to look at that. Um, for me, that will help inform the town, how many staff positions do we need? What skill sets perhaps that we need, um, things like that. Uh, the issue with waiting until September for um, addressing planning staff is that, yes, we're under a moratorium for new subdivisions, but there's a lot of workload still happening. And I think it's really important for us to not blur the lines of, of current staff too much. So speaking for myself and for Joseph, we are being pulled into out of necessity into planning topics as a stopgap i'm okay with that for four or five months i'm not so i think it is important that we look at some opportunities to um, perhaps bring in some people that can help with planning before the new administrator but i don't want to necessarily rehire the same positions just because that's what we had i'd like to look at what opportunities are out there for us plus what responses we get from that RFP on planning services. So um, there's someone sitting next to me this evening that you might recognize. Um, Joel is back with us right now as a, as a, contracted, as a contractor. Um, he was gracious enough to jump back in and help us focus on some of these water topics ahead. Um, but I, I'm also gonna start pulling him into planning topics as well. Um, very capable, educated planner that is, yeah, with us. So, um, so I, I would like to proceed 
with trying to rebuild the planning department as best we can. I don't know how that's all going to look come September, but I just know if we sit on it the whole entire time, it, it, it's going to get really awkward because people still expect the town to take care of, of our business and with our current staffing, we just can't can't do that. Plus it seems like if we just came out of the moratorium and, and then hired somebody, that would be pretty chaotic as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, yeah, I think it would. Yeah, I think it would. Yeah, no, I mean, I just want to clarify because I thought we, I guess I think we had a post and then we pulled it down because I didn't know what that pause was going to be and how long. So, yeah. so the idea is put the RFP out there, see what services we could possibly get from other folks and then kind of build around that just with a better idea of what our capabilities might be. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Um, so there's that. Joseph's helping with the RFP um, for that. Um, like I mentioned, Joel Joel's going to be pulled into some of the like the crossings and some of the things that are already in the in process that we need um, some attention to uh, for water. We I think it's. Uh, it's critical that we conclude on some of these open topics before the end of the moratorium or before the board can even evaluate whether the moratorium should continue or end. Um, so uh, Joel and our water team, our legal team will be working on um, bringing back a discussion about the ordinance at the next meeting. And that would, um, that would look at the, the time boundaries around water dedication, also uh, tying in our water allocation policy into the code. And it would kind of conclude, um, put boundaries around the water augmentation, how that's applied um, so that it's not um, um, for, for one case and not another. So we want to make sure our code gives the town flexibility, but also doesn't kind of pigeonhole us into, um, well, you did it for this person, but not this person, why, right? That inconsistency. So, and I know you all have shared similar thoughts. So that to me is low hanging fruit because the board has discussed those topics. Um, <coughs> it's been in the public conversation for a while. We need to wrap that up because an ordinance also takes a little time to work back through uh, planning and zoning, board of trustees, and then 30 days after that to become uh, effective, right? So we want to keep an eye on that end of moratorium date for that. Then on July 11th, uh, we're looking at having a work session that's focused on our water strategy. And that's going to talk about augmentation, water rights, um, our new water rights like Bray Allen, how those pieces fit together, our discussions with Upper Arc about buying water, acquiring water. So that would give the board kind of a, an opportunity to make sure we all are on the same page with those kind of key components, definitions, how they fit into the water strategy, because we do have a water strategy. We just need to pull it out, look at it, and see how these pieces fit in. Um, but it would also kind of let us conclude as well so we can move forward with things like the water purchase from Upper Arc. So before you're seeing that detail, we want to talk kind of higher level water strategy first. Um, so again, um, Joel's on board to help us get to that point. Thank you, Joel. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It sounds like a great plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do want our water team at that work session as well. So Cindy Cavell will be there. Uh, Rachel from Right Water will at least be zooming in just so you have your experts there to, to talk to and make sure that we all understand the direction we're going. Is that going to be a six o'clock on July the 11th? It might be a 530. Okay. Just to give enough time. Girl, it is water. It is. Um, <laughs> yeah. So if we want food, if we want to start a little earlier, kind of just have more time to it, I think that would be yeah, okay. a good idea. I, I mentioned this email, I think, in some of the other meetings too, but is there a way we could also have in that meeting a representative from the county or something? How does whatever, because we're not in a vacuum with what we're doing, right? I mean, 
from upper arc to it, the changing of, again, keep the county, county and town, town. And how does that all tie in? Is there any, does it serve any purposes or is just another person at the table who causes confusion on how whatever we're doing ties into whatever the county is currently doing and also their kind of view on the holistic water picture? It's a good question. Um, we can see we could probably at least for this session rely on like Cindy Cavell and her expertise for some of that. Um, certainly can ask uh, to see if someone from Upper Arc um, could come. The county uses the Upper Arc, you know, and, and I mean it's really the the Upper Arc is the water provider for the county, right? So. Um, so we can kind of see how Terry might be, you know, feel about coming in at this point. Um, but let's get, maybe we could kind of get our feet uh, into what the water strategy work session would look like too, and see if see if there's room there, or if it's better, you know, to do a secondary kind of session. Okay. Um, so that's what that works. Yeah. I just, again, you know, we've talked about this before, but given. There has been some uncertainty about water for a while, and there's kind of been a vac. Like a, it's allowed a lot of people to have many different ideas that then come to us with all these different ideas. And I do my best, to be like interesting. Oh, we can do that. Thank you. And then move on. But it would just be helpful the more that we can kind of answer some of those outstanding questions. And I think part of that is the how any of our water policy and honestly all the other services that we're we're dealing with are going to. Be impacted by different things that the county does and how we interact and stuff so yeah the, the, the inter interface really is something that we have been wanting to work closer and closer with them with upper Arc and the county on mm -hmm. um and we haven't gotten you know we've had some traction and then it kind of gets you know waylaid a little bit here and there yeah um so we'll have to take a look because you universe is unique in that we control we own our water Right, and no other municipality really. I mean, we we own control the use and the management of that water, and everyone else works directly with the upper arc, like they give them their water essentially to to manage. And so we're in a little unique situation relative to the county, but it, it is something we have to explore. Um, so let's let's kind of okay. I don't want to throw it in if it's yeah. we have other stuff we need to go. It's first. Like say a little hanging fruit, but our strategy, and then that is just something that again keeps kind of popping up. So it'd be good to know more about. Um, yeah, other than that, I think it's just kind of keeping our departments moving ahead and not falling behind on finance. That's kind of my interim plan. Good. Seems like it's going okay from the outside perspective. I'm grateful we have. Uh, pretty our core team still with us and we still have people that want to work with us so uh, i think we're in good shape thank you for taking it on yeah sure mm -hmm. thank you thanks for coming back joel yeah Welcome mm -hmm. back. community effort team effort so um so there's a compensation amount um, that Philip would be paid until um, a new administrator takes office. Is there a motion to um, have me sign this agreement? I will make the motion for you to sign that agreement. I'll second. Okay, we have uh, Swisher and Hilton Hinga. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion passes. Thank you, Philip. Thank you all. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Paula. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you, trustees. Will there be a budget adjustment for that, or is it taken from the already? It's taken from our existing administration budget. Yeah. 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 I can put the trustee accounts. <laughs> yeah, no, good question. I appreciate you bringing that up, but no, it, it fits within our existing budget. Cool. Just wanted to get no. clarification. 
your finance director appreciates that question. <laughs> Take off one hat. That's right. <laughs> okay, the last item is to reschedule the uh, board meeting, which has been moved to July 27th of 23, put it back on July 25th of 23. Is there any discussion of that? Um, I think we should move it back to the 25th because it was moved for Lisa. Um, I think changing the dates of our meetings with the public can be very confusing. And in the future, I mean, when Philip was town administrator, he missed a meeting and we all survived without mm -hmm. him being here. And I do think we should be very careful how we change our meetings for our public reputation. Mm -hmm. no, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, is there another meeting that we should move, the one where we're going to be at CML? That's already been moved. It's already been moved. But it's moved. You mean move it back? Well, that was because everyone's from it. We wouldn't have a quorum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's different. And there'd only be two. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, I'll make a motion to move to reschedule the 27th board trustee meeting to back to July 25th. Second. So we have Roe and Cobb. All in favor? Aye. Is anyone opposed? Motion passes. Okay. So now we are at trustee staff interaction. Do we need to talk about that letter, the Venture Foundation, or is that just that was in our packet? Oh, that letter is, yeah, yeah, it's a letter of support for the Boys and Girls Club um, uh, grant application with Venture Foundation. And that would come from you would sign that. Yeah. So it's just to support my signing the letter. Would you like to make a motion to that? I move that we let Libby sign that letter. All right. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Cobb and Hilton and Gun. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. Okay. Now um, we have Mr. Parker on Zoom. And uh, Jeff, this next thing that I'd like to talk about just as part of trustee staff interaction is um, apparently the Chafee Housing Authority has asked you to, uh, your firm to take on some uh, legal services for them. And I assume you want to disclose that there, whether it could be a conflict of interest or well, yeah. So, you know, in the past, I forgot how long ago it was, this was a request made by the JP County and Housing Authority. My One of my law partners, Kendra Carberry, specializes and has a lot of experience dealing with um, affordable housing legal issues. And so we ran this by um, the town several months ago, and she just does special counsel work for them. She's not their general counsel. So she'll deal with certain projects, help them with certain contracts, et cetera. And the deal sort of was now is it nothing to do with Buena Vista because we we didn't want to just have two attorneys from our firm advising two clients dealing with a similar issue. But I guess in the process of doing special counsel work, she's been asked, could you could you please provide us with sort of more general counsel work? Because she's encountered, I guess, some concerns that need her expertise and just sort of making sure that everything they're doing. Uh, as an overall entity complies with Colorado um, local government laws and um, affordable housing type laws. And so they really need uh, somebody with that kind of expertise to help guide them, you know, with sort of board board member uh, voting questions to open meetings compliance to making sure that they're handling their finances appropriately so they can actually properly issue bonds under the law. And, and I guess, um, the concern is, is that is that they're having trouble, I think, finding somebody with that kind of expertise. And you know, unfortunately, um, doing business with the Chafee County Housing Authority as this town plans to do, you really wanna make sure that Chafee County Housing Authority is in compliance with all the legal requirements so there's no blowback to the town. 
And so the benefit of having my partner handle that is that, you know, you can pretty much be assured that it's going to be, uh, at least the advice you're going to be getting and the legal guidance you're going to be getting is going to be putting them in good stead to be a good partner with the town of Buena Vista. The trade-off is, is that if there's actually any sort of adverse issues, if we get crosswise with them, um, both of us may have to recuse ourselves and the Chaffee County Housing Authority and the town may need to actually get separate special legal counsel. Um, we don't anticipate that happening, but it could. And so I wanted to just sort of check in with the board and see, you know, take your temperature to see if you're amenable to my partner taking on that work. Um, you know, we could certainly work on, you know, mutual documents uh, as long as, you know, we're basically just sort of getting the right terms in place for both of our clients, even if we're both going to be signing the same agreement. But if there's some serious negotiations that involve, um, you know, strategy and that kind of things, then we're then we would have to recuse ourselves. Um, I think in speaking with Philip, you know, I think both of us kind of felt like it probably not a huge high chance of that happening where we'd have to basically step aside, you have to hire another attorney. But, you know, it happens at times and you just can't foresee the future. But so the short of it is, is that, um, you know, we don't need the extra work. You know, my partner's plenty busy, we're plenty busy. So, you know, it's not like we're actually, you know, begging for this or asking the town to do it. Um, but we see the benefit to both the town and to the Chaffee County Housing Authority of having having Chaffee County Housing Authority get good experience, legal advice on affordable housing issues. It benefits both, but there's some risk in doing that. And Univis is our firm's long-term client. You know, we basically, you know, we're not going to do anything to, to jeopardize that relationship. So I wanted just to sort of have a conversation with you. And if the board says, you know, this is making us uncomfortable, we're not really happy with it. Well, then we just tell Chaffee County Housing Authority that we can't do it. If the board says, hey, you know, we recognize there's some potential issues in the future, but, you know, we think it would be really great to have the Chaffee County Housing Authority getting good legal advice from an experienced attorney. Um, we're willing to accept, you know, the potential that we'd have to have recusals and hire special counsel if there's a big issue, then we probably proceed. So frankly, I'm kind of putting the ball in your court. I'm happy to answer any questions. And ultimately, whatever you sort of think is appropriate, we'd have to do a disclosure in writing. And, and we basically, if we see anything that we are uncomfortable with or that could possibly be perceived to be a conflict, we would certainly inform you. And we would basically... Um, either recuse ourselves or Kendra will recuse herself. We have to depend on, depend upon the type of conflict. So we, we do this for other clients, frankly. Um, Kendra represents the town of Vail and, and a Vail Housing Authority. Um, and, you know, so far, no, no real issues. Um, we represent some clients that overlap in jurisdictions and generally there are no issues, but there are at times. And, you know, sometimes, you know, one of our clients we did this for, you know, everybody thought, oh, this would be great, it's no problem. And then literally in one week, we had a conflict that came out of nowhere and we had to get special counsel for both clients so it can happen. Um, so anyways, I'll stop talking, but I, I wanted to take your temperature and just see what you think. Because um, frankly, we're, we're, we're the town's attorney and that's where we're always going to be the town's attorney first, so. I have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, if uh, say an issue did come up and both of you had to recuse yourselves from that issue um but then you, you you come back i mean you're still there for every other issue right yeah yeah absolutely yeah so you're, you're just usually it's like a specific issue where there's like a real i guess a, a, an adverse sort of position or you're having a serious you know adverse negotiation of contract terms where each party is basically you know getting legal advice and, and confidence I mean, just drafting regular agreements where like, hey, you know, here's everybody, here's all the parties to this agreement. Here's what we want to put on paper. You know, we can generally do that as long as we think it can be fair to both parties and both parties are okay. Um, but yeah, it would just be a specific issue we'd accuse ourselves for and then we'd be dealing with everything else. You know, we just would be walled off from that particular issue. But if we started bumping into multiple wants of those, we could then ask you if maybe, or tell you this maybe isn't working out and that would be okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, you know, like I said, you know, 
we're a busy law firm and we, we frankly really aren't looking for more work. I'm kind of looking for less work. So it's not like, you know, this is something that we really want to do. We really you know need. It was just that I think we feel sort of an, somewhat of an obligation. Kendra would like to help Chapey County Housing Authority. I'd like to have them getting good legal advice. Um, I just, I think it'd be beneficial to the town, but there's some risk to it too. So. Thanks. Seems like you're being very upfront about it. Oh, you know, hey, I get it. This is one thing I don't ever mess around with is any potential conflict or I, I want to be totally transparent. Um, I don't like to get very close to any types of conflicts. And this is, this is, this is close enough, but um, yeah, like I said, I, I really, I, I, my, my num number one goal in life is to, is to be a, a upfront attorney and people, people can trust and not feel like we're trying to make more money than we should off of more clients than we should have. You know, I, I never want anybody to think that. So particularly with a client like Buena Vista, where I think I've been your attorney since maybe 2008. It's been... <laughs> Oh, been a while. Just a kid. <laughs> yeah, I'm still a kid at heart. So. <laughs> I mean, I think it sounds great. I think just having the shorthand and like say, speaking the same language as whoever is the attorney for Chibi County Housing Authority would be incredibly valuable for us. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't know if it outweighs the value of if we have to then hire another attorney because yeah. there's conflict, but I think uh, given that it might be limited more than anything, it'd be very valuable to have that being in sync with the, you know, the housing tour would be very helpful. Yeah, you know, I mean, I guess I, I look to Kendra for advice on affordable housing issues all the time. She deals with it more than anybody. So, so you know, she's a great resource, and, you know, and yeah, generally I think that we're going to have aligned interests with the JP County Housing Authority. Um, and I don't really anticipate a huge issue, but yeah, like I said, we, we have several clients with overlapping issues and, you know, things do come up and, it, it, it can have you know you, you have people on the chief county housing board so it's not like you know they're completely separate entities they're supposed to be serving Buena Vista and the other members so hopefully it won't be won't be a big issue Jeff if you but, have to con conflict out do you have suggestions or do you have other attorneys that you rely on that could, could yep. step in quickly yeah yeah ultimately you know the decision is totally up to you who you want to bring in of course like any, any attorney, but you know, we, we have attorneys that we will do conflict work for and they can do conflict work for us. And we would certainly provide you with names of good attorneys um, if necessary. And so you could, you know, it's, it's usually been, most of our clients have been pretty happy with whoever we've recommended. Um, and they, you know, they have their own completely independent obligations to you. And so we just step right aside and they just represent you like, you know, you're their client. So, and they're good attorneys. Right. Yeah. I think if we have the best law firm, we should be able to share a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't foresee. If, like you said, if it comes down the line where we think it's it's not a good relationship, we got them first. So. Yeah. We win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know, I know that Kendra has spoken with the new director there and made it pretty clear that you know that Buena Vista is is a long term client, and you know if if a client is able if they're able to waive you know a conflict, then we would continue to represent Buena Vista if they could waive it, and they would have to get special counsel. You know, ultimately, if there's a real conflict. Um, depending upon the nature of it, they still have the right to sort of require us to step aside from representing Buena Vista as well. But, you know, I think that the representation from them is as long as there's nothing that would jeopardize their getting good legal services, we could stay with Buena Vista. But once again, it's, it's, it depends on the conflict and depends upon what they ultimately want to do at the time. We don't get advanced waivers for any kind of conflict. That's not ethical. Okay. Right. So will you send us a letter to this? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I'll provide, you know, you can, you can, we can either have, have it come back to you at another meeting, like the next meeting, um, or, you know, you could authorize Philip to sign it. Um, if he feels comfortable with it, whatever you feel is appropriate, but we put it in writing, we'd lay it out, kind of how we handle these things. And then so you'd, you'd be basically providing what's called informed consent. Um, you know, you're, 
fully authorized to hire another attorney to review it and give you advice on it. Um, uh -huh. Most of our clients don't do that because they're comfortable, but you're certain, you know, this is the kind of thing where it has to be in writing and you have to basically agree to it by signing our letter. So, okay. Great. So I guess, I um, at this point, yeah, at this point, I'm going to I'll prepare it. I'll send it to Philip. And then I guess, you know, maybe just so we're completely clear, we'll just put it on the, on another agenda for you to basically, you know, agree to just so we're completely above board, if that sounds okay. Sure. Okay. All right. Great. Well, yeah. thanks. Appreciate you listening to that. Yeah. Sure. That, um, okay. Um, I just want to remind the public that they have until Monday, uh, June 19th at the close of business, five o'clock to submit any further applications for a replacement trustee. Right now we have three applicants, I think. Mm -hmm. Three. Um, and then I would like to invite Peter to speak first um, in trustee staff interaction. Did you want to talk about the water scheduling or anything? No, I think that was helpful. Uh, what Philip broke down earlier, I uh, just for everybody else, I wrote an email to uh, Philip and Louis beforehand saying that during this interaction, I'd like to get some sort of timeline on how we're going to utilize this time during the moratorium to focus on water and clear benchmarks of what we want to achieve, when we hope to achieve it by, so we can like, I know one of my frustrations over the past year or so has been like, a, these are really important issues when you talk about it and then it's, we don't hear about it for three months and then this is a huge issue and we can't deal with it. It's like, I'd like a clear, so everyone, so the public also knows, it's like, we now have 90, not 160 or whatever. I uh, hate, I was thinking 360 and 180 for some reason, instead of 120, anyways. Um, just having that open and clear understanding of these are the goals we hope to achieve during this period. These are the thing like, and then working backwards from that 99 days from now, whatever it is, we hope to hit these benchmarks to show that we're showing progress. And not that some of those eyes, but it sounds like, you know, what Philip just mentioned, kind of touches on that because I was hoping for like rough draft. That's more than rough draft. So that's good. Um, okay. Great. Yeah. Is there and anything that, else you'd like to talk about? Uh, sure. I guess it's not having to do with any of that, but I, um, I also serve on the uh, Judicial Review Commission. Um, so in the blue books, when you see like retain judge, don't retain judge, and you like bio and stuff like that, um, there's commissions for each of your jurisdictions. And I'm on the one for the 11th here. Um, and so I've just been in and out of courthouses for the past few weeks doing observations. And um, something that just really struck me and it came up again tonight. And I think even when looking at the, the library growth and the amount of people who are coming in, um, just that we have, I mean, I've mentioned this multiple times, but it's clear that we are having a lot of stress points and nearly kind of bursting at the seams right now. Um, and it's not just BV, but Chafee as a whole. Um, Sol Vista clearly, I mean, serves a great purpose for the community, but it is just like casually listening to these cases and, and the load and what they're asked to do that's not really in their purview, but they're kind of asked to do because the, they're the only ones in the community who can do it. Um, I don't know, we're just, we're really strained. I mean, I think we all know that, but, um, you know, I think as we uh, talk about growth, development, just keeping that in mind of all of the different elements of our community and our society that are, it's like, I think the judge's court uh, load is reaching capacity. Um, like the doctor's reaching capacity for the entire county. Um, so that's just something we need to think about all the different elements of our community as we look at the growth. And it just impacted me on how, on all the different levels, we are clearly reaching that growing pain. That's pretty tough, so. Thanks. Thanks. So, um, the only thing I, I wanted to say, uh, it, when it was an item on the consent agenda, what's the um, special events permit, just to congratulate staff um, for finishing that up and making the quick changes and in that, I think it'll, it'll really help. It's a, it's a good document. Great. Thank you. Um, Cindy? Um, um, in moving things forward, reaching our capacity, I guess I can go ahead and say it now, but in the 
planning department, I think it would be wise to slow down on our growth and seriously think about having adding one major project in the subdivision, one major a year. And it's still gonna take several years for the ones that are in progress to build out and finish their projects. And we are limited on um, how much work can physically be done in a day. And I worry about um, burning out our staff. And I think we need to take that mm -hmm. into consideration. And it wouldn't be um, something for us to think about and talk about at a later meeting, but it, it still wouldn't be that we weren't providing growth because it's going to take several years to build out what's going on right now. And I do worry about the people that are holding Buena Vista together mm -hmm. getting burned out. Yeah, I agree. And something to consider. And then talking um, the historical preservation guidelines. I've asked several times about those and it keeps getting put on the back burner. And every time it gets put on the back burner, another project appears that wouldn't um, fit in. And so, I don't know if we're serious about protecting our main street, if it's something that you guys are even interested in, but I think that um, I would like to find out whether it's serious enough to you that we can bring that forward and see if some of those guidelines could be mandatory to fit in with our main street while we're having our rapid development. So I have a question on that. Isn't the holdup that, that we're waiting for the committee to reach a consensus and that's why we haven't heard from them? I recall, because didn't they come here and then they asked to um, postpone it or something because they didn't, couldn't find a consensus? Or? You know, I remember that wrong. I honestly, I can't tell you. I don't know exactly. I, I do know that uh, draft code language and, and draft uh, requirements and process were shared with the public. I, I would, from my perspective, I don't think the community bought into what was drafted and shared. I know there was the intent statements, I think, are fairly like desired. We want to preserve you know, X, Y, and Z, okay, great. But I, but I think what, what had been presented um, highlighted some issues with the process that was drafted and some of the code language that was drafted and an over complication of our existing code. And I don't, so I think there was a lot of public feedback into that. Um, I don't know where that ended up before we uh, lost at planning department. So I honestly, I don't know, and I apologize for that. And my understanding actually matches Peter's because there was a public hearing that was scheduled that they, I think, decided should be postponed, yeah. but it actually sort of happened that night. And then I think the ball is in their court about when they're ready to try to do something like that again. That was my understanding, Cindy. Okay. I just, I mean, that, that was what I was waiting on until it came back. So the, the historical preservation committee or society, they, they had like, before it could be presented to us, they had to reach a consensus or something like that. They couldn't reach consensus and, or. And that's kind of what, and just reading with the minutes that they've submitted, I think it confirms exactly that. If I may, there, uh, that, that is the process of events that I, I recall as well, and being part of that public comment at that time. Um, there, there, there was a couple processes that were being kind of woven together within that one document. 
And I think that uh, in order to help preserve some of that, you know, some of the intent of what some of those guidelines could be, I think um, some changes to chapter 16 in the municipal code could happen separate from the whole, whatever HPC is wrestling with, you know, some so of the processes. So we really can't do anything until we get a planning department again. Uh, or, or, or at least staff that could pick that up because that is a has serious implications not only from what we want to achieve but not having unintended consequences. I, I would like to make sure that we have capacity from a staff perspective to really work through those points before it is brought back for for consideration of approval. I, I, it might be really close. I just think we need to check back in with that committee and see, are they still working on those discrepancies or, or, or what? I, yeah. And Joseph is still on staff, so he can help guide us on kind of where, where that left off. Okay. Seven. No, I don't think I have anything. I just noticed that in this newsletter, there was a little blip on us on the CML newsletter about bill of funding. Huh. So well, that's kind of cool. I for that. Carbonate Street. Yeah, for Carbonate Street. Oh, that's good. So we'll have something to talk about at the conference. <laughs> yeah. Where people will talk to us. About. <laughs> Yeah, you get to brag about all the grant funding that has landed in in Buena Vista. Um, we we were that's awarded. A picture of our... No, that isn't a no. picture of our cupola thing. Oh. When I saw this ad, and I thought it could be. <laughs> I yeah. see that was... <laughs> but after that, no way. Yeah. And a stock photo. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Dola did award us another one hundred thousand dollars for the. <laughs> Process. Great. Oh, yeah. Is Joseph managing that process? Um, he is not yet. I'm not kicking that off. We don't have staff to yeah, okay. handle that. So I want to, we'll have plenty of time, I think, when we get the new administrator to get going on that. So we got the funding, we'll get under contract, and then it'll be all ready to go for. The next person. Great. Okay, good. Yeah. So, do you have anything else, Philip? No. <laughs> no, please don't. Yes. <laughs> Joel. Okay, Paula. Nothing. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for just pitching in and acting like a team. You know, we're all we're all in this together, and and we just want what's best for the town. Um, I've been trying to pick up some of the slack too in terms of going to some meetings and ribbon cuttings and things for, instead of Philip. Thank you. It was nice to watch the stage and not have to get up there and do anything <laughs> with it. So thank you all, Cindy and, and Sue and Libby, for, for doing that for us. Yeah. So, but, um, you know, we'll get through this. It's just some turmoil in the meantime, but, but we'll get through it. Just keep smiling, have some fun. So um, we have reached the time in the meeting where there's one last motion from Devin. With me? Yeah, no, to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. So Roe and Cobb, and all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? This meeting is adjourned. Motion passed. Good night. Good night, Thank you. Good night, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, good night. Thanks, Chief Bertram. Good night. The whole, whole time. Thank you.